In the wake of the terrorist attacks in Garland, Texas, more threats of violence from ISIS. Should there be free speech limits, particularly where religion is concerned? Attorney and law professor Alan Dershowitz will explain. And later, in the wake of the death of Freddie Gray in Baltimore and the riots that followed, what needs to be done to heal race relations in America? Deacon Larioni is here to talk about his personal experiences with racism and his plan for inner city renewal. And finally, to help celebrate Children's Book Week, best-selling author of the Seven Wonders series, Peter Larangis is here. So gather up your young readers. The World Over Live begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Alan Dershowitz, Larry Oney, and Peter Larangis are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send us a tweet at Raymond Arroyo, or you can email us at worldover at EWTN.com. Lots to get to. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. The investigation continues into the apparent terror attack in Garland, Texas. Counterterrorism officials are studying potential ISIS links left by Elton Simpson and Nadir Sofi. On Sunday, the two heavily armed men attempted to open fire on the site of a Prophet Muhammad cartoon drawing contest. They were both killed by an off-duty police officer. The men had expressed online support for ISIS and had contact with other sympathizers. The Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack, praising the perpetrators as soldiers of the caliphate. The group also promised more attacks in the U.S., including the killing of the event organizer, Pamela Geller. More about the attack, free speech, and its limits in our next segment. And for the second time in as many elections, the U.K. has a hung parliament. However, in a bit of a surprise, it appears as if conservative leader David Cameron will remain prime minister. As in 2010, the Tories are short of the 326 seats needed for an outright majority, but they are well ahead of the Labour Party. Cameron has two choices if the numbers hold. Continue a coalition government with the Liberal Democrats to get to a majority, or have the Tories go it alone with a minority government, being only 10 seats short of a majority. Negotiations are underway. Back here stateside, a trio of Republicans jumped into the 2016 presidential race this week. Former Hewlett Packard CEO and 2010 Senate candidate in California, Carly Fiorina, made it official on Monday. The arena says Americans are ready for a Washington outsider after years of political gridlock. She says she will reform bureaucracies and budgets and use her tech background to get government moving again. And retired neurosurgeon Ben Carson also made his run for the presidency official on Monday in his hometown of Detroit. Like the arena, Carson is casting himself as a political outsider and tapping into voter discontent with the D.C. establishment. I'm not a politician. I don't want to be a politician because... <laughs> politicians do what is politically expedient. And I want to do what's right. And on Tuesday, former Arkansas governor and Baptist minister Mike Huckabee launched his second presidential bid from his hometown of Hope, Arkansas. In 2008, Huckabee won eight primary states, including Iowa. But the landscape is very different this time. The latest Quinnipiac poll in Iowa has Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker maintaining an early lead at 21 percent. The nearest candidate is Marco Rubio at 13 percent, and Huckabee comes in at 11 percent. Jeb Bush leads the national field, according to the latest NBC Wall Street Journal poll. And likely presidential candidate Senator Rick Santorum has clarified recent comments he made that were taken to be supportive of Bruce Jenner's intention to transition to a woman. During a BuzzFeed roundtable in South Carolina last week, Santorum told reporters when asked about the former Olympian, quote, 
If Jenner says he's a woman, then he's a woman. My responsibility as a human being is to love and accept everybody, not to criticize people for who they are, end quote. The statement garnered a lot of media attention. Santorum took to Facebook on Sunday to explain. He wrote, My comment affirmed Jenner as a person made by God in his likeness, as we all are. It was meant to express empathy, not a change in public policy. Hashtag compassion. Santorum is expected to announce his candidacy for president later this month. And congressional Republicans passed a budget plan this week. Along a near party line vote, the Senate approved a plan that would balance the federal budget in 10 years. The blueprint would cut projected spending by $5 trillion and enable Republicans to gut Obamacare without the threat of a Democratic Senate filibuster. As expected, Democrats opposed the plan. Presidential contenders Ted Cruz of Texas and Rand Paul of Kentucky were the only Senate Republicans who voted against the blueprint. Both have said that the plan uses gimmicks to achieve the purported 2025 balanced budget. Also passed in the U.S. Senate, a bipartisan bill allowing Congress to review and even reject any final nuclear deal with Iran. And Chicago Archbishop Blaise Supich is weighing in on the immigration debate. This past weekend, he joined Democrat Senator Dick Durbin for a panel discussion pushing for reform and legislative action on the DREAM Act bill. The legislation would normalize the status of most immigrants brought to the U.S. illegally as children by their parents. According to the Chicago Tribune, Archbishop Supich called for a grassroots effort on immigration. He encouraged people to, quote, look for ways to tell our heritage stories and tell your representatives how you feel, speak out, and don't let racist comments go by, end quote. For his part, Senator Durbin, who is also Roman Catholic, encouraged reformers to register new Hispanic voters. If we add two million new voters, that would change the debate, he said. It will have an impact. A Cold War era defector is claiming that the liberation theology movement within the Catholic Church was actually hatched in the Kremlin. In an interview with the Catholic News Agency, former Romanian general Ion Pasipa said the movement was born in the KGB and named and developed by the Soviets during the 1960s. Its goal was to reshape South America via the Catholic Church. The liberation theology movement combined Marxist political philosophy with a theology of salvation that demanded liberation from social injustices. Liberation theology is usually attributed to a 1971 book by Peruvian priest Gustavo Gutierrez. And is Pope Francis tipping his hand as to what might be decided at the upcoming Synod on the Family? Continuing his weekly catechesis on the family, the Holy Father on Wednesday spoke of what he described as the beauty and unimaginable dignity of marriage. He then challenged the faithful, asking, do we accept fully ourselves as believers and pastors this indissoluble bond of the history of Christ and the Church with the history of marriage and the human family? Are we willing to take on this responsibility seriously? The comments appear to leave little room for those seeking an overhaul of the Church's teaching or practice regarding marriage. We shall see. In spite of the Pope's comments, Swiss Catholics are calling for recognition of same-sex partnerships and allowing divorced and remarried Catholics to receive Holy Communion. According to a statement from their Bishop's Conference spokesman, quote, the exclusion of remarried divorcees from the sacraments must be ended and partnerships for gays and lesbians should have a place in the church. He added that only a small minority of Swiss Catholics support the current doctrine of the church with its rigid discipline. Meanwhile, Pope Francis made some time for a little basketball on Wednesday. The Harlem Globetrotters made the Pope an honorary Globetrotter while in Rome. The Globetrotters have had several papal audiences, having met with all but two popes, going back to Pius XII. And finally, the Vatican has released the latest details for Pope Francis's upcoming Jubilee Year of Mercy, which begins December 8th. The motto for the year is Merciful Like the Father, a paraphrasing of Luke 6:36 
And here is the official logo, which has received mixed reviews. Some online have described the image as Jesus the pro wrestler, others as a two headed mythological creature. It is a little difficult to make out, but that is not a two headed man. It is purportedly Jesus carrying another man. Curiously, Jesus and the man share an eyeball. The artist Jesuit father Marco Rupnik explained that Christ shares the eyes of Adam. Now I understand. I wrote about 10 marvelous endings to this story, but instead I shall try to be merciful like the Father. When we return, should free speech be circumscribed if it offends religious sensibilities, particularly Muslim sensibilities? Jurist and attorney Alan Dershowitz will tell us. The World Over continues in a moment. Stay right there. She should be put before Sharia court and tried. And she's if not a guilty, Muslim. of course, she will face capital punishment. She's not a Muslim, Anjum. She's not a Muslim. She doesn't believe she what you believe. She should have thought that before you she had this competition. In Welcome back to the World Over Live. That was Imam Anjum Chowdhury responding to Sean Hannity of Fox News. When asked if Pamela Geller should be put to death for hosting a cartoon competition amid calls from the Muslim community to curtail some speech, the question arises, should free speech yield to religious sensibilities? To discuss is attorney, Harvard Law professor, and author of the book Terror Tunnels, the case for Israel's just war against Hamas, Alan Dershowitz joins us from Manhattan. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Dershowitz, uh, the, the entire Geller event, let's face it, it was provocative, it was incendiary. Isn't there a responsibility to use free speech well? Shouldn't there be? For purposes of the First Amendment, as distinguished from morality, there is no difference between Martin Luther King's march through various southern towns where he deliberately picked the cities in order to provoke uh, segregationists and provoke violent reaction so the world should see the brutality of segregation mm -hmm. and Pamela Geller. Now, one can't compare Martin Luther King and Pamela Geller in any other way, but for purposes of the First Amendment, it doesn't pick and choose the kinds of ideas or provocations it protects. It protects all forms of provocation. Now, you can't incite your own people to violence. Right. That may be a violation of the First Amendment, but you are entitled to say whatever you want and if other people are incited to attack you, the role of the police is to protect, protect the provocateur and arrest those uh, who would prevent her, in this case, from speaking. Mm -hmm. Now, that you, you referenced uh, the limits of, of speech, of course, fighting words, that's off limits from that 1942 case, Supreme Court case. Uh, would you... That's no longer a good law. That's no longer, you, that's you no longer a good law. Up. I don't think that's any longer a good law. No. Really? No, because if it did, that any group, any group could veto any speaker by simply threatening. Every time I speak about Israel on university campuses, mm -hmm. there are some anti-Israel groups that say, you make us feel unsafe, you're being provocative, you're being uh, incendiary. incendiary. And if they can do that, if they can define my words as fighting words, even though they're moderate and call for a two-state solution, mm -hmm. then they would have the power to decide who can speak and who can't speak. So fighting words, I think, has been overruled in subsequent cases. Take, for example, the young man who wore a jacket into a courtroom which mm -hmm. had F blank 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 oh. the draft those were very provocative incendiary words or that church that used to picket funerals of soldiers right the Supreme Court has consistently upheld provocative speech and it ought to do so uh, I want to ask you a question as I've read so much commentary from the Islamic community this week they they say and I'm going to quote from one article here it says repeated demonization can inspire violence and even the Pope when the Charlie Hebdo thing broke he was concerned that when you when you create that incendiary environment you are going to get a natural reaction the question is should freedom of speech at times that's just not true to freedom that's of just, religion no no that's just not true when Farrakhan 
makes horribly provocative statements against Jews, mm -hmm. Jews don't go and try to kill him. When imams preach in churches all over the world demonizing Jews, Jews don't try to kill them. Christians don't try to kill them. Only radical Muslims today are using threats of weapons, fatwas, going after Salman Rushdie, going after Theo Van Gogh, going after mm. Charlie Hebdo. No, uh, you don't allow people in the name of religion mm. to censor provocative or even outrageous speech. To do so is to encourage mm. people like the censors and the fatwa issuers to do more and more of that, to say, we're offended, we're offended, so you can't speak. That would mark the end of the First Amendment, essentially. Mr. Dershowitz, do you believe, and it sounds like what I'm hearing anyway, is that there's something inherent to Islam that is uh, generating this, this tension in these democracies around the world. Is, is that what you're saying? Is there something no, I don't inherent think in radical Islam? No, I don't think there's anything. There's nothing inherent in Islam. Uh, there's something inherent among some radical Muslims, and it's not only from the bottom. It's mm -hmm. from the top down in places like Iran, where the fatwas were issued. So you have very distinguished imams who are now calling for the use of violence against people who offend the prophet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Islam has the right to impose itself on its own followers. Mm -hmm. But I Islam can't tell me what to draw and what not to draw. And certainly the law can't support Islam trying to tell people from other faiths or no faith how to comply with Islamic sensibilities. Now, I would myself choose not to. Mm -hmm publish uh, a cartoon that was uh, offensive to my friends in the Muslim community. Right. But they can't use the law and they can't use violence. They mm -hmm. have to enter into the court of public opinion and try to persuade people like you and me not to do it. Mm -hmm. No, I tend to agree with you. I think that there, there, because you can do it under free speech, you shouldn't always do it. And I think this was provocative, but you got to right. defend their right to do it in a, in, a, in a democracy, and particularly in this one. Um, I want to move on to this Baltimore case, Mr. Dershowitz. The mayor, Stephanie Rawlings Blake, is calling on the State Department to come in and investigate what she calls, quote, excessive force and dis discriminatory policing. Is that a good idea to bring the feds in? It's a very good idea. It's a very good idea. Anything that replaces the current uh, state attorney, district attorney, and gives an objective assessment of what went on is a good idea. She has really disqualified herself by saying, I hear the crowds, I hear the call, no justice, no peace, which mm -hmm. really means unless we give you the kind of justice you demand, we will have riots and unpeaceful demonstrations. So I think this is a perfect example of where the federal government, the Justice Department, would do a better job of investigating than the local state uh, district attorney has done up to now. So yeah. I welcome the, the, the Justice Department I wanna, coming in. I want to play a bite from that state's attorney in Baltimore, uh, Marilyn Mosby. Here she mm -hmm. is announcing the indictment. And then I want to share with you some recent breaking news. Roll that. Officers Miller and Nero then placed Mr. Gray in a seated position and subsequently found a knife clipped to the inside of his pants pocket. The blade of the knife was folded into the handle. The knife was not a switchblade and is lawful under Maryland law. Now it turns out that that knife apparently had some sort of spring action which was in violation of Baltimore law. Can these, can these police get justice at this point, in your opinion? I think it's very hard to get justice when the fear is if a jury were to acquit, they might provoke additional riots and mm. endanger businesses and homes and even lives. The case has to be shifted to another city in Maryland where the jurors will not have a stake in the outcome other than to see that justice is done. Right now, there's too much violence in the air and too many threats to fear that there might be mob justice, crowd justice instead of objective justice. Okay, before I let you go, I have to ask it, you being in Boston, uh, what do you think of Deflategate? Is it time for Tom Brady to take a little time off, given that this report suggests that he knew about the deflated balls? Well, the report says it's 51:49 that he knew, so it's almost as likely that he didn't know under the report that he did know. This standard of evidence by a preponderance is an extremely low standard. 
I would like to see more scientific uh, investigation. I'd like to see more evidence. But if it turns out that they broke the rules, there have to be consequences. This is a really stupid rule. Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. A stupid rule. There should either be a rule that says all footballs have to be exactly the same, same dimensions, mm -hmm. or anybody can adjust the football which to whatever is comfortable. To their liking. But the idea of saying you can adjust it a little, but you can't adjust it too much, <laughs> is an invitation to this kind of chicanery. Alan Dershowitz, thanks so much for being with us. Terror Tunnels, your new book, The Case for Israel's Just War Against Hamas, is available at bookstores everywhere and online. I hope you'll come back to the show. Love to. Thank you. When the World Over returns, how to address the racial unrest and violence in inner cities across America? Is there a solution we're missing? Larry Oney thinks there is, and he will join us in a moment. Stay right there. It's not a war. It's not a war. We want peace, but y'all got to give us that. If y'all keep coming and taking everything we got, we got to take what y'all got. We're not playing out here. This is not a war, but we want our rights. Welcome back to the world over. The rioting in Baltimore has once again brought to the surface racial tensions that we have seen in Ferguson, Missouri, New York, and elsewhere. The question arises, what is driving the violence and fueling these tensions? Some say it's economic inequities. But my next guest suggests it might be something deeper. He's a self-made businessman from New Orleans, a deacon who's preached around the globe, and founder of Hope and Purpose Ministries, Deacon Larry Oney. Deacon, welcome Raymond, to the program. Thank you very much. Great to see you. Uh, now, I want to set the stage a bit and let people know your background. You were the son of a sharecropper, and you grew up literally working in the fields right. of Hollybrook Plantation, one of 11. What did you learn there? What did you see and experience there? That the, the price of cotton at two cents a pound was not a fair price. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I knew I'll that. Say. But, but as a, at a very young age, I did experience some of the struggles of poverty. Uh, mm -hmm. 11 children, and my dad made $35 a week, which was mm -hmm. not a lot of money, and my mom was in the fields like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I realized that working hard is one of the requirements to move forward. We worked very hard, but it was difficult for us to move forward. There were some forces at work that we couldn't overcome. Yeah, and, and I love the fact your mother takes you to Kenner, which is a New Orleans suburb. Uh, you leave, you know, you leave where you were. You move to Kenner. What did you find in what was then billed as the promised land? Well, as you say, uh, in the book, uh, Amazing Grace, Overcoming Race, that I share my story about, yeah. uh, the promised land wasn't so promising there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had the same issues, a uh, lot of uh, 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 issues with crime, mm -hmm. uh, some of the same problems, but emanating from a different viewpoint. Yeah. So we didn't have a lot of work. Food was still very difficult to come by. So the city and even the suburbs have its own issues. And you, you encountered real racism there. I mean, you really hated white people at the time. I did. Tell us why and how you overcame that. Well, I, I like to think that I've overcome completely, but nobody ever overcomes. Maybe when we get to heaven, we'll be yeah. perfect in all things. Yeah. But one thing that happened in my life that was really powerful, uh, I did have a lot of bitterness and a lot of uh, uh, bias, if you will, and anger, frankly. But the thing that helped me to overcome, as I recall, one Thanksgiving, we didn't have any food. And this woman, who didn't look like me, came to our neighborhood, offered us food. And some people say, well, did food change your mind? It made me think about, I can't continue to hate all people that look different like me. It was a mm. it was a powerful moment in my life, and we still talk about that moment in our family now during Thanksgiving. It's a powerful time for us in our family. Mm. We are seeing racial tensions really ignited all over the country in a way that, frankly, in New Orleans, and people would think it would be otherwise, but in New Orleans, you don't see that kind of, um, I guess, racial division or uh, palpable hatred that, that I, I found in some other places, certainly in Baltimore and Detroit and other places, it's, it's profound. Why do you think that is? Well, some people say that uh, New Orleans, we're busy always. This, we call it the big easy. Yeah. But I really think, though, that we live in very close quarters in New Orleans. You can go from St. Charles Avenue, as you know, Raymond, yeah. uh, and go two blocks away, and you're in 
uh, a situation where there's a lot of poverty. But if you go to the city, you'll see that the races work very close together. I want to be quick to say, yeah. we certainly still have our issues Absolutely. in New Orleans, but uh, it seems that the kind of rioting that you've seen around the country, I think a lot of people be very surprised if you saw it in New Orleans. I want to show this poll. This is a national poll of more than 1,000 people. 61% of Americans say race, religion, race relations in the U.S. are bad. Now, what do you think is fueling all of this that we're seeing, the, the, the increase in tensions? That's a, that's a new high, by the way. And blacks and whites now are almost on a par with how they regard race relations. And they're seeing it as, in the majority, negative. Well, I'm no sociologist, but I think we have to deal with this reality. When people feel disenfranchised, when they feel hopeless, when they feel like there's nothing to live for mm -hmm. and they don't have a voice, uh, then they express themselves. They're trying to get attention, saying, I need you to look at me. I need you to pay attention to what's going on. Now, the answer to the problem, it's complicated, but I think there are some things that we can do as a nation from a spiritual standpoint to begin to talk about those issues. A lot of people say it is inequality and a lack of new programs, government programs, that is fueling this unrest. Do you buy that, or do you think there's another solution? I, I don't buy it, Raymond. I, look, we need some fundamental programs, but really, before we try and deal with the issue of, uh, particularly in inner cities, mm -hmm. about all of the things that we have wrong, we have to deal, we have to go back up and start from a spiritual standpoint, uh -huh. because uh, renewal in uh, the cities uh, has to start from uh, the people's hearts being renewed, black and white and brown skinned people. If we don't start from that basis, we're just going to be turning over dollars. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. Yeah, there needs to be some infrastructure improvement, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to start from a spiritual standpoint. To change the hearts of people Absolutely. and their lives. I want to play something for you. This drew my attention this week. President Obama launched his Brothers Keepers Alliance. Okay, this is a group that was founded to help disadvantaged youth and has already attracted millions in corporate support. After meeting a young man without a father, the president had this to say. I grew up without a dad. I grew up lost sometimes in a drift, not having a sense of a clear path. And the only difference between me and a lot of other young men in this neighborhood and all across the country is that I grew up in an environment that was a little more forgiving. 72% of black children are born to an unwed mother today. How do you deal with this epidemic of fatherlessness in the black community? And not only the black community, it's, in, it's, it's moving across all communities today. Well, you're absolutely right. Those numbers are moving now. The white community is catching up right. to what's happening in the black community. But it really speaks to a deeper societal problem mm -hmm. that we don't respect the idea of marriage and one of the uh, underpinnings of our society is the uh, sustainability and the desire for families to be intact. When that breaks down, we're going to have some of the problems that we have in the black community and the white community. It's really a national problem. Yeah. It's a spiritual problem. It's a deep one. Now, you have been, and I can't say yet which diocese, but a major diocese yes. has called upon you and uh, Hope and Purpose Ministries to initiate a program of inner city renewal. This is a plan, and when you told me about this, it's something that really could be replicated in other dioceses. Tell me about this plan and the vision that you want to bring to the inner city? Well, it's a, it's a, it sounds like a, a, a grand plan, but really it gets back to the basics. Mm -hmm. What we hope to do is do pre-evangelization. Raymond, I really believe that one of the things that we have to do is to be involved with people before we try and evangelize them. What, is, what to, does it mean, pre-evangelization? That is, get to know you. We can't make disciples until we make a friend. We have mm -hmm. to get to know people, know what their problems, what their struggles are. Mm -hmm. So this particular diocese is very interested in what Hope and Purpose Ministries is trying to do in terms of getting in the community, doing the pre-evangelization trying to get people together, finding out what's going on, and then rallying them, and hopefully that energy and that enthusiasm will touch the whole community, not just the black community or the Latino community, but the whole of the community. We have to start. The church has to go out of the church into the highways and byways, into the streets. Mm -hmm. There can be no uh, revitalization of cities until there's a spiritual revitalization. It's scriptural. That's you see it. when then the, our Jewish brothers and sisters went back to build the temple and oh. build the city, they were praying 
and worshiping their God, and they were working. It requires oh. both. Now, that's the foundation. Uh, I want to play a bite from you. This is uh, Captain Ronald Johnson of the Missouri State Highway Patrol. Now, he spoke at a gathering in Boston just this past week, and he addressed how the clergy were the instigators of calm in Ferguson. Listen to this. I think you'll agree. Well, I tell you, the early days of Ferguson, a lot of the clergy came out, a lot of people of faith came out and tried to talk to the protesters. The protesters would not hear it. And I can tell you by the end, the strongest voice that I say that brought calm to Ferguson was the clergy and, and, and those of faith that came out and ministered to the citizens of, of St. Louis. And then they would listen when the law enforcement voice or the superintendent voice of the school could not calm the crowd. The faith of God did, and so continue to do that. And I think that is what is going to continue to drive us to be better. Sounds like your plan. Uh, he's right on it. Mm. <laughs> he's got it. We, we can't expect that we can change a nation and the hearts of the nation and the people of the nation by simply uh, having more programs. We have, to deal with, right, we have mm -hmm. to deal with the messy business of people's lives and try and raise them up. Now, you see, you told me about this earlier, this messy business. You are daily involved in this messy business. And look, you've got a, you've got a, 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 a company that's got offices all over the country. You've got plenty to do. You've got your own family. Yet, Freddie you're Gray taking time. You're ministering to prisoners, working one-on-one -on -one with people in the communities that you're now penetrating outside of New Orleans. How do you find time to do that? And what do you mean when you say this is a messy business? Well, when you look at Jesus, for example, mm -hmm. when he got involved with the woman caught in adultery, it was messy business. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think Pope Francis has been telling us we need to get involved. It's not a nice and neat program. Yes, there is a young man that I've been ministering to for two, three years, my wife and I. We're involved in the messy business of his life. He was incarcerated. He, now he's out of jail, and he's got to rebuild his life. It, it would be great to subcontract that to somebody, but it <laughs> takes time. It takes resources and commitment that this is a soul, and which is one of the tenets of uh, Catholic social teaching, that the dignity of every person. Mm -hmm. So God has put that person in our lives. And we can't say we're doing general evangelization. No. So each one of us must personally have somebody or some bodies that we're pouring a part of ourselves into. Now, there are three tenets to your work, three principles you're trying to impart and that really drive your efforts, and I imagine will define what you do in these dioceses and in the inner cities. Absolutely. What are they? So the major tenets are uh, basically we want to give people a hope and a purpose for their lives. And of course, the object of the hope is the person of Jesus Christ. Now we want to help them discover their purpose. This works for people that are incarcerated, in jail, out of jail, in a crime-ridden city. It doesn't matter. They need to know. The second thing is, just like the Israelites when they were crying out when they were down in slavery, they said, Lord, have you forgotten about us? God raised someone up to say no through Jeremiah to say, no, I hadn't forgotten about you. Mm -hmm. I plan to give you a future full of hope. So we want to give people a sense of hope in their lives. And also part of our mandate, our personal mandate and the ministry mandate is to expand the kingdom of God so we can have influence and also help to trans form our society. How do you engage the community? Like, you know, in one of, in the diocese that you may be going to, let's, let's just leave it generic. How do you engage the wider community? Because in so many of these cities, unlike the city we hail from, the people are on the margins. You've got, you've got, you know, suburban flight, they've run to the suburbs, and then you've got this crumbling inner city. How do you get the people who fled the inner city to come back and evangelize, engage, and become one, and take on the smell of the sheep, as Pope Francis is saying, in the midst of what we're seeing in the inner city today? That's a good question. We have to get people in the suburbs and that are removed from the inner cities to buy in and get involved as well by showing them that it's to their own best interest because we can only run so far away from crime. Mm. We, we have to realize that crime and drugs and poverty is going to touch us in terms of higher taxes, et cetera, so we've got to be involved. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, in this particular diocese that we're trying to work with, mm -hmm. we have to involve the larger community in this effort. They have to not only write a check, they have to be present. There is a ministry mm -hmm. called the Ministry of the Presence. Yeah. Simply being there is a part of the ministry. We're going to invite people to do that by trying to rally the whole church toward, mm -hmm. let's try and build up this community. In our final minutes, what form does this take? You, you drop into a parish and do what? 
Well, uh, I, we were talking earlier, Raymond, when I get a, an invitation to go do a conference mm -hmm. or go to a parish to do a, a mission, uh, I always opt for the parish because mm -hmm. the action is where the people are, the people in the parish. Not that conferences are not important, but when you're in a parish now, we can uh, involve ourselves with the pastor. We can talk about the issues. We can pray with people. We can give people who are just going through life and try and give them a hope and a purpose for their lives. Even good Catholic people, we can try and impart a hope and a purpose for their lives so they can now pour part of themselves into others. Deacon Larry Oney, thank you so much. Thank we hope you, you'll uh, stay with, keep us up to date on what's happening Absolutely. in this uh, important mission that you're undertaking. To find out more about Deacon Larry Oney and his work at Hope and Purpose Ministries, you can visit their website at hopeandpurpose.org. When we return, it's Children's Book Week, and we'll talk about the importance of stories, writing and reading them, with author of the Seven Wonders series, Peter Larangis. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. This week is the 96th annual Children's Book Week. It's the longest running national literacy initiative in the U.S. Joining us to discuss the importance of reading and what drew him to young audiences is the writer of over 160 books. He's author of the Seven Wonders series, including his most recent, The Curse of the King. Please welcome New York Times bestselling author, Peter Larangis, who's joining us from New York. Peter, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, I, I, I have read that y you saying you identify with outsiders from the time you were a kid until now. Why? I was a really bookish kid. Uh, I was not very athletic in a place where a lot of the other boys in my class were. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved reading. I loved losing myself in my imagination. My idea of a good time as a kid was to shut the door in my bedroom and put a pad of paper on the desk and huh. let my crazy ideas fly onto the page. Wow. Um, this was great. I loved, I loved that feeling of escape. I loved that feeling of kind of propelling myself into another world. Well, mm -hmm. you know, those things didn't necessarily sit so well with other little boys. Huh. So I found myself being, being teased a lot and, mm -hmm. uh, and having to kind of more or less retreat into the into those worlds that I would dream up. So I kind of identify I identify with 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 kids who are a little bit different, who hmm. who want to follow a path that that your other friends aren't necessarily following. Now now tell me how a guy with a degree in biochemistry from Harvard no less ends up writing children's books. Where <laughs> how did this path happen for you? Utter confusion, really. <laughs> um, you know, growing up, uh, let me give you um, an example. Growing up I was about 12 years old. We, we had an assembly in my junior high school, and they hired a career counselor of some kind. I still don't know exactly what this guy did or who mm. he was, but he made an announcement that those of us in the audience being 12 years old by now should know what we wanted to do for a living. Mm. And of course, that petrified all of us because none of us did. Well, sure. this guy just went on to to kind of tell us why you needed to do that. And at the end, someone in the question and answer session asked, uh, what if I want to be an artist? Or uh, maybe it was a writer or an artist or something like that. And uh, he said, well, there's a, there's a few things you got to know. Number one, you'll never make a living. Number two, you won't be able to support a family. Number three, you're always going to be worried about, uh, about your next penny. And he would just list these negative things one after wow. the other. And I remember sitting in the back and going to myself, oh, Okay, that's not so bad. <laughs> oh, all right. Now, who needs a family? <laughs> who needs I money? Mean, you know, who needs at 12 eat? years old, right? <laughs> yeah. But I remember thinking, even back then, um, you know, that's, that's something I would really want to do. I knew I had the ability to do it, and my teachers reinforced that. I had great teachers, and mm -hmm. my teachers all said, you know, you really you have a flair for this. And I listened to them, and I took that very seriously. Mm -hmm. But the older you get, the more you get the signals that... It's not a real easy life. It's mm. not something mm. that people really do if they want to be serious. So, of course, as I got older, um, I was the kind of kid who, you know, I did well in school, so I figured I should probably do something serious. So 
majoring in biochemistry was my way of putting my round peg into a square hole. Wow. I would have been the worst doctor in the world. I, I, I faint at the sight of blood. It would have been terrible. <laughs> you would never have wanted to have me as a doctor. <laughs> but, but all um, of this so comes back. So majoring in biochemistry was something I, I set aside. I mean, aside. It, as I read the Seven Wonders series, which I want to talk about in a moment, th that biochemistry yeah. sort of comes into stark relief once more. And we could talk about that in a moment. Remind me. Uh, but you are Greek. Tell me how your visit to Rhodes inspired this Seven Wonders series and how the biochemistry fits in. My wife and I went to Rhodes on our honeymoon and it was an amazing experience. Now, we have fa I have family there, so that, ah. was, uh, that, was, that was really what drew us there in the first place. But the island itself is, is magical. And we were sitting out in the harbor and I pictured the Colossus astride the harbor. Um, mm. And it was the first time I'd ever seen it and had, to, had an idea of the scale of this statue. You know, it was the sun god Helios and it guarded the harbor. And the idea that it would have, it would have towered over the ships that passed underneath it seemed absolutely impossible. I couldn't imagine how it could have been built. So that led to, um, that led to an interest in all of the seven wonders, and it really mm. came from that trip to Greece. And the more I learned about those seven ancient wonders, the more I realized that I didn't know what they were. Growing up, I'd never learned about any of them, and each one had the most fascinating story, and it became clear why they were, they were considered so magical and so wonderful in, in, uh, in ancient in ancient mythology and ancient mm. history. Um, so I always parked in the back of my mind that I'd, I'd want to write about them someday. And, and where did the biochemistry fit oh, in? And how biochemistry, oh yeah, yeah, you, they said a little biochemistry piece about it. Um, <laughs> biochemistry has nothing to do with what I write, except for the fact that uh, I think when you learn when you learn the sciences, when you study the sciences in college and you do it rigorously, you, you learn about how to ask questions. And as a writer, you're constantly solving mysteries, mm -hmm. uh, and as a scientist, you're doing that too, and you're asking very logical questions, and you're setting it up, and you're not settling for anything but the right kind of answer. And when you write the plot of a book, you've got to do that too. You've got to be that oh. demanding on yourself, otherwise your readers aren't going to believe it. Mm -hmm. So, no. in a way, it's connected. Yeah, and, and, and well, the open of the book in the first, in the, in the Colossus Rises, the first uh, Seven Wonders book, uh, we find Jack McKinley, your protagonist, your hero, and he's, he's He's in an operating room. He's in this odd place. He has the condition. Some of your biochemistry uh, background sort of had to inform a bit of that. Right, right. Because, yeah, well, that's, that's a good point. Because also we're talking a lot about genetics right. in this book. How is it that you can inherit something from centuries ago that doesn't express itself until 2015 or, or mm -hmm. 2014? You know, how, how is that? And it is possible. Um, and genetics has always fascinated me. So, yeah, I think that mm. having studied that it was a, a big part of this plot. Mm. But, you know, we are connected to our past through genetics. Mm. And by understanding it, we can understand who we are and where we come from. And, uh, you know, the, I was interested in exploring that in the book, too. Peter, you know, there's a connection I'd never seen before. Thank you. Yeah, no, well, I, I, it jumped out at me when I, you know, when I started reading the, your, your, your canon here. Uh, Jack McKinley, who, as I said, is your hero, he has to find seven objects hidden in the seven ancient wonders of the world. What do you think attracts children to this series? And then I'll tell you what's attracted mine to it. Well, I think part of it is that it's an impossible adventure. Mm. The seven wonders, six of them have been destroyed. How, mm. do you, how do you go about finding these magical objects, number one, even if the wonders were there, and mm -hmm. only one of them is, only the Great Pyramid is? Um, now, it's, it's life and death. They are 13 years old. They've only got till they're 14. So for, for me, I think part of the lure of it for kids is this time clock, is this idea that you've got one year, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And you've got to not only find these, but you've got to find the wonders, the wonders which have been destroyed by earthquakes, by, by battles. Nobody knows where they are. It's really, it's really dire. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they've got to do it, and they've got to do it using the skills that each one of them has, because that condition that they've inherited from this prince that escaped Atlantis centuries ago, this condition takes whatever they're good at already and turns it into a superpower. Uh -huh. So one guy's got amazing athletic ability, and the other, the girl, uh, Allie, is, is incredible in tech. I mean, she's got mm -hmm. the skills that could, that could tap into the United States government if she wanted to. <laughs> I mean, that, that level of, of expertise. And Jack, our hero, 
he's got some special skills too, but he doesn't know what they are. Huh. And he starts learning what they are as the books go along. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how middle grade fiction has changed in the time that you've been writing. And we should say, and I want to get into in a moment, uh, some of your previous work. But how has it changed, or rather, how have the expectations changed? It's a good question. I, it, when you talk about middle grade, I mean, just to make it clear, because mm -hmm. these are really specific terms and maybe some uh, viewers don't really know what they are. Mm -hmm. um, middle grade is not middle school. Right. Middle grade in publishing is grades three, more or less, grade third grade through more or less seventh, right? Mm -hmm. the, the heart of it is fourth through sixth, but it's really third through seventh. Right. Above that is what they call young adult, YA. So there's right. a difference. With, with middle grade, um, I think the biggest changes actually have happened in the, in the YA or young adult arena. There's topics that we would never have dreamed of, of, of broaching even 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Middle grade hasn't changed as much. The things that were important to kids, I think, a generation ago are still important. They've just, they're making that transition from you, their primary identification being their parents to being their friends. They're negotiating what loyalty means, what, what, what honesty means, how, mm -hmm. how you're being true to yourself, true to your friends, and how you break away from your parents, how you connect, mm -hmm. you know, you make these connections with your peers, right? That's mm -hmm. what these books are all about. Plus is a heavy dose of humor. I mean, yep. at that age, kids laugh at everything, and they want to laugh at everything. <laughs> so what I love, what I loved to read when I was a kid were adventure stories, because in adventure stories, you take all of those choices, all of those decisions, all those moral and ethical decisions, and you pin them on really, really exciting, uh, you know, adventures like survival, Jack London stories about right. survival in the North, you know, Edgar Allan Poe stories about psychological survival. Mm. All of those things bring this all into really, really sharp relief. And I, I think that's what draws me to adventure stories. And, and honestly, an adventure story that I, that I would have written 20 years ago might not be all that different from what I'd write right now. Peter, I'm launching a literacy initiative next year, or later in this year, and there are a series of questions that I'm asking all authors. These are rapid-fire questions, so I'd like you to take a shot at it. Your favorite children's book and why? That's a tough, I've got to do it fast, right? Okay, um, Charlotte's Web, because, because the, its themes are so emotional and, and, and so economically written. Mm. Least favorite book? <laughs> well, uh, if I'm going to ask you the favorite, I'm going to ask you the least favorite, Peter. <laughs> the least favorite? Yes. The least favorite book. Yes, the Dick, the Dick Tracy novelization written by Peter Larangis oh. in 1990. Oh, horrible. calling himself out. Don't That's not fair, Peter. That's nice, but not fair. Uh, the story, <laughs> what is the story, or is there a story that helped you find your path in life? And is there one life lesson there that you've never forgotten? Yeah. The story was called To Build a Fire by Jack London. Ah. I read it when I was about 11 or 12 years old. Um, at, I was about the age of the target reader for my books. Hmm. The book was so affecting to me that on a really hot day, a 90 degree day in my bedroom, which didn't have any air conditioning, I was shivering from the cold because I identified so strongly with, uh, with the character who was trying to survive and trying to help his his husky, his pet husky, mm -hmm. survive. Um, it excited me so much that I felt so cold on such a hot day that I ran downstairs to tell my dad because I wanted to share that with him. But he was involved in a baseball game, and I just, sh I shut, I shut it down. I didn't want to share it. I wanted to keep it. It was such a special feeling. I <laughs> thought later, I'll tell him later. Ran back up to my room, finished the story, and when it was done, I said to myself, "That is, that is magic. The fact that he could make me feel so deeply." using just words, no illustrations, just words, is something that I think I would love to do someday. And it changed my life. I began thinking that day that writing was something I wanted to do. Wow. Where do you write and why, Peter? I write everywhere. Um, I have an office that I rent from, I have an office that I rent in an apartment directly above mine in Manhattan. So I actually 
leave my apartment, go up 13 steps, enter another apartment, and shut the door, and I'm in a totally different place, but it's about six feet away from where I live, <laughs> which was great when my kids were young because, yep. you know, there, there's that barrier. I mean, I'm always there for them when they need me, right. but if I need to be by myself, they've got to go to another apartment, so there's this level, level of formality, mm -hmm. um, and it was great, and I've been doing that for 25 years. Wow. If you could choose one writer mentor from the past or present, it would be whom? Harry Mazur, and I had the pleasure of having him as a mentor. He wrote a lot of books uh, that were popular in the 80s and 90s, and he became a mentor and a friend of mine when I was a young writer. And when he, a few years ago, um, had a stroke, uh, it, he had kind of orphaned a book that he wanted to write hmm. called Somebody Please Tell Me Who I Am, oh, about a young uh, sure. GI who comes back having lost his memory. And, uh, and he could, Harry couldn't write the book. And my agent, who was also Harry's agent, said, Peter, you know, oh, how would you like to do that? How would you like to pick up that mantle and huh. go ahead and write the book? And, you know, there was only a couple of page introduction. So I got together with Harry and Harry's wife, and they gave wow. me the blessing to do it. Uh, and I had that amazing experience of taking an idea from somebody mm. that I admired and that I'd learned so much from mm -hmm. and um, and turning you know make, realizing his dream and also writing a book that was from my own heart. No it's a beautiful book I, I've read it it's it, it really is quite moving it's a, it's a soldier who comes back and has to sort of piece his life together it's really well done. A advice to parents Peter who mm -hmm. want to get their kids to read what should they do? Read to them all the time read to them every night it establishes the value and the joy of reading books one of the things that that we did when our boys were growing up was we, we it, no matter what happened we sat down every single night we opened up the book even if we were exhausted i remember one time my, when my boy, when my older son was very little i noticed <laughs> i'd fallen asleep while reading him and he he took his his fingers and he was prying my eyes open he was saying daddy daddy keep going keep going I'm going, what <laughs> that's when you but know we, the story you know, and the reader it, are no good how tired we were yeah, right. And the other thing, you know, that I, w I would say that to, to parents, and a lot of them would say, well, you know, I'm not that good at it. They would say, you know, you're good at it. You write. You can do funny voices. You make mm -hmm. it so animated. But it doesn't matter. I've seen so many parents who aren't that skilled, who, don't, who read in kind of a monotone. It doesn't matter. Your kid is going to be absolutely uh, riveted. And I've seen this mm -hmm. so many times. And they will become readers. You know, it may take them a while. Some, mm -hmm. t some take longer than others, but establishing that, establishing the habit and the joy and the love and the, mm -hmm. and the togetherness that comes with a parent-child bond early on, associating that with reading, is absolutely invaluable. Before I let you go, this was the most surprising bit of research I discovered: that you had ghostwritten a, a lot of those Sweet Valley Twins and the Babysitter Club books. How did this happen? <laughs> I was starting out, uh, when, I, when I graduated college after the big crisis of not knowing what I wanted to do, uh, I went into the theater for a while. I was an actor for mm -hmm. eight years. In between acting jobs, I failed miserably as a waiter. I was terrible. <laughs> I just I kept getting fired from jobs. And I began <laughs> instead freelance copy editing for publishing companies. Wow. By doing that, I was free to go off on auditions and classes. Mm -hmm. Now, when you start editing people, you're rewriting other people, and mm -hmm. your confidence gets better. I began realizing that I could do it. I could probably try to fulfill the dream that I always had of being a writer, and I did. I, would, I sort of wormed my way into getting <laughs> a few work-for-hire projects, and I started writing books. Now, at the time when I decided I was going to become a full-time writer, there was a lot of work being a ghostwriter for series like Sweet Valley Twins, Sweet Valley High, mm -hmm. and The Babysitter's Club. And that's how I got my start. Uh, started with the Hardy Boys. How the Babysitters and the Sweet Valley Twins happened is a little bit of a mystery to me because they called me huh. and they said, uh, you know, we'd like you to do this. And I said, well, you know, um, <laughs> I'm a guy. <laughs> I write <laughs> Hardy said, Boys. Yeah, we know, we know. Give it a try. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a Hardy Boys guy. Guy, guy. But uh, I don't know how it worked. And you know what? I mean, 
for me, uh, what I did was I went to where my strengths were, I, the humor. I put, a, I put a lot of humor into the books. Mm -hmm. And if I had to do cl clothing descriptions, which was the most <laughs> difficult thing for me to do because I didn't really know anything, I would take my, I literally would take my wife's clothing catalogs that she got in the mail. I would sort of flip through them and say, hmm, yeah, this character would wear something like that. And I would just copy the clothing descriptions. It, it, I mean, it, know, it worked for, for you and for a lot of young women and girls who've read the book. So, Peter Larangis, thank you so much for, t for the time. Like, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, Raymond. Great to talk to you. And I would encourage everybody. Good luck with your book. The book is uh, The Seven Wonders, The Curse of the King. It's in bookstores now. It's a fantastic series, The Seven Wonders. Uh, it's available everywhere and online. Thanks again, Peter. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. You can also sign up for my free e-blast. I'll send you exclusive news you won't find anywhere else and links to the show segments and more. Don't miss next week. Author Rod Dreher will be here. He'll tell us how Dante saved his life and might save yours. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, Thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.